Hello and welcome to this video. My name is Manuel Joseph Lockias and I am assigned to do a video lecture on line integrals of scalar fields. This lecture will consist of three parts and this is the first of them. Okay, let's begin. Suppose you are given a continuous function f in two variables x and y. We assume that your f is positive. This means that the graph of f should lie somewhere above the xy plane. In addition, we also have a smooth curve c on the xy plane, which is parameterized by the vector valued equation r of t with components x of t, y of t, and your t is any value in the closed interval a, b. In the figure on the left, the curve C is represented by this blue curve. The initial point of the curve C is at t equals a, and the terminal point of your curve C is at t equals b. Remember, the graph of your function f is somewhere above the xy plane. What we do now is we, pro we project each point on the curve C above to the graph of your function f. The projected points will form a curve which lies on the graph of your function f. And it's represented by this red curve here and denoted by f of r of t. What we are interested in is the surface which lies above the blue curve c and lies directly below the red curve f of r of t. In the figure, the part of the surface visible to us is shaded light blue. You can also imagine the surface as a curtain which is dancing in the wind. What we want to find now is the surface area of this curtain. To find the area of this curtain, we will employ the usual steps in coming up with a definite integral. To recall those steps, I usually think of three words. Partition, approximate, and sum. For the partition part, recall that the curve C here is parameterized by the variable T, where T lies in the closed interval AB. Hence, we start by dividing the closed interval AB into n subintervals of equal length. This is usually called a regular partition. We denote the endpoints of the subintervals by T0, which is just A, T1, and so on, up to Tn, which is just your B. What is happening here? Recall that the initial point of your curve is at t equals t0 or t equals a, while the terminal point of your curve is at t equals tn or t equals b. Each of the endpoints here will correspond to a point on your curve c. For instance, in the figure, this point corresponds to t equals ti, while this point corresponds to t equals ti plus 1. In effect, what we have done is to divide your curve C into sub-arcs. And there will be n of them. And we denote the lengths of those sub-arcs by delta S1 and so on, delta Si and so on up to delta Sn. Note that these lengths are not necessarily equal. The next step is to approximate. Recall that our goal is to find the area of this curtain. And what we want to approximate is the area of the curtain which lies above this sub-arc. To do that, we consider each sub-interval, ti minus 1ti, i from 1 to n, 
and we choose any arbitrary number ti star in that subinterval. This ti star will correspond to a point on the xy plane, which is x ti star y ti star, which we simply write as xi star yi star. Because of the fact that your curve C is smooth, we expect that this xi star yi star must not just be in C, but it must lie somewhere between the point corresponding to t equals ti and t equals ti plus 1. Say somewhere here. Let's go back to our goal. Our goal is to approximate the area of the portion of the curtain that lies directly above this i sub arc. Notice that this portion of the curtain is approximated by this rectangle of width delta si and height f of xi star yi star. Hence, the area of this portion of the curtain is roughly equal to the product of the height f of xi star yi star and the width delta si of this i rectangle form. We now go to the third part, that is sum. Remember, our goal is to approximate the area of the entire curtain. What we have so far are the areas of the different rectangles form. Each of those rectangles will have area f of xi star yi star delta si. Therefore, an approximation of the area A of the curtain is just a summation of all the areas of the rectangles and we take the sum from i equals 1 up to n since there are n such rectangles. Note that this summation is still an approximation of the area of the curtain. Indeed, this portion of the curtain is neither a rectangle nor a planar region. In fact, in general, it should be a curved surface in three-dimensional space. Nonetheless, observe that as delta Si becomes smaller, this rectangular region becomes a better approximation of this portion of the curtain. Hence, to obtain a better approximation of the area of the curtain, all that we need to do is to make the length of each sub-arc as small as possible. And this is achieved by making the number of sub-arcs, which is n, as large as possible. Hence, we say that the area A of the curtain is given by the limit of this summation as the number of sub-arcs n approaches positive infinity, assuming, of course, that this limit exists. This discussion leads us to the definition of the line integral of a function f in two variables x and y with respect to r plane. We have the following formal definition. Let f be a function on R2 that is continuous on some region containing the smooth curve C, where C is parameterized by the vector valued equation R of t with components x of t, y of t, where t is in the closed interval AB. Then the line integral of f along C with respect to the arc length S is given by the limit of the summation of f of xi star yi star delta si, where the sum is taken from i equals 1 up to n, and the limit is taken as n approaches positive infinity, if this limit exists. The line integral along a curve with respect to the arc length is denoted in this manner. You have a single integral whose subscript is c, where c is the smooth curve, and we have ds, where s is the arc length. How does the line integral differ 
with the integrals that you already know. In Math 21, you have learned of definite integrals which are taken over or evaluated over closed intervals AB in one-dimensional space. Earlier in Math 23, you have learned of double integrals which are evaluated over regions R in two-dimensional space and triple integrals which are evaluated over solids S in three-dimensional space. In this case, your line integral are taken over smooth curves C in two-dimensional space. Thus, you may think of line integrals as curve integrals to remember this property. We continue with the following remark. If minus C denotes the curve C oriented in the opposite direction, then the line integral along minus C of f of xy with respect to the arc length S is just the same as the line integral along the original curve C of f of xy ds. This fact can be observed from the definition of your line integral. Take note that in the definition, this delta Si, which is the length of the i sub arc, does not depend on the orientation of your curve C. Now, how do we actually compute for the value of this line integral without going through this limit process? For that, all we need to recall is the following formula. The derivative of the arc length S with respect to T is equal to the magnitude of R prime of T. From this formula, one can show that the line integral can be expressed as a definite integral with respect to the parameter T of your curve C. That is, it is the integral of f of x of T y of T times the magnitude of r prime of t, dt from a to b. One can easily remember this formula by taking note that ds from this formula is exactly magnitude of r prime of t, dt. The x and y here should now be expressed in terms of the variable of integration t and your t lies in the closed interval a, b. Furthermore, keeping in mind that the components of r prime of t are x prime of t, y prime of t, one obtains the following formula for the line integral of f of xy ds. We are now ready to solve an example. In the example, we are being asked to evaluate this line integral. From the previous remark, we know that the line integral is equal to the integral of f of x of t, y of t, times the magnitude of r prime of t, dt. And since the parameter t of your curve c should lie in the closed interval 0 to pi over 2, then the limits of integration should also be 0 and pi over 2. To continue, we need to identify f of x of t, y of t, and the magnitude of r prime of t. For f of x of t, y of t, take note that your curve C has vector valued equation r of t with x component 3 sine t and y component 3 cosine t. Hence, to obtain this, all we need to do is to substitute x equals 3 sine t and y equals 3 cosine t in your function f equals x squared y plus x. Doing that, we get x squared, which is just now 3 sine of t quantity squared, multiplied by y, which is 3 cosine of t, plus your x, which is again 3 sine of t, and thus we obtain f of x of t, y of t. To get the magnitude of r prime of t, we first compute for r prime of t. And that is obtained by taking the derivative of each component. The derivative of the x component is 3 cosine t 
while the derivative of your y component is negative 3 sine of t. And thus, the magnitude of r prime of t is equal to the square root of the square of the first component, which is 9 cosine squared t, plus the square of the second component, which is just 9 sine squared t. Since 9 cosine squared t plus 9 sine squared t is equal to 9, this simplifies to 3. Substituting the magnitude of r prime of t, which is 3, we now get that the line integral is expressed as a single integral with respect to t. And we proceed as to what you do in your uh, Math 21. Continuing, as you can see, we can factor out this 3 and this 3. So I get 9 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2. I am left with 9 sine squared t cosine of t plus sine of t dt. Integrating each term, for the first term, I can let u to be sine t because du is just cosine t dt and what I get is an integral of u squared. So this leads us to 3 sine cubed t or the integral of the second term is simply minus cosine t. And you evaluate this from t equals 0 to t equals pi over 2. Evaluating... Um, sine pi over 2 is 1 and cosine pi over 2 is 0. So I get here 3. While well, sine 0 is 0 and cosine 0 is negative is 1. So I get minus negative 1. And this gives the final answer of 9 times 4 or 36. Before we continue, let me ask, what does your curve C look like? To see it, Observe that if we compute for x squared plus y squared, where your x is 3 sine t and your y is 3 cosine t, we obtain 9 sine squared t plus 9 cosine squared t, or simply 9. This implies that your curve C lies on the circle with center at the origin and radius 3. However, the x component of C and the y component of C are both non-negative whenever your t is in the closed interval 0 to pi over 2. This means that your curve C is not the entire circle but only the portion of your circle which lies on the first quadrant. Furthermore, note that at t equals 0, we get the point 0, 3, this point here. And at t equals pi over 2, we get the point 3, 0, which is this point here. And from that, we deduce that the orientation of your curve must be in this direction. Recall from Math 22 that the parametrization of a curve is not unique. For instance, this vector valued equation with parameter u in the closed interval negative pi over 2 to 0 represents the same curve C. As an exercise, evaluate the same line integral but with respect to this parametrization of curve C. If you actually do it, you will see that the line integral is still equal to 36. The point that I am trying to make here is that a line integral along the smooth curve C is independent of the parametrization of C. That is, if C can be parameterized by this vector valued equation with parameter t in the closed interval AB and this vector valued equation with parameter u in the closed interval CD, then the line integral along C of f of xy with respect to the arc of S can be evaluated using the parametrization R of t and hence, we get a definite integral with respect to t. And we can also evaluate it using the parametrization s. 
And what we get here this time is a definite integral with respect to the parameter u. And the results will be the same. For the next remark, take note that an important assumption in our discussion is that the curve C is smooth. Nonetheless, we may also define line integrals along curves that are not smooth but piecewise smooth. Recall that the curve C is said to be piecewise smooth if it consists of a finite number of smooth curves joined at consecutive corner points. That is, your curve C is the union of smooth curves C1, C2, up to Cn. In that case, the line integral along C of f of xy with respect to the arc length S is defined to be the sum of the line integral along C1 of f of xy with respect to S plus the line integral along C2 of f of xy with respect to S plus and so on plus the line integral along Cn of f of xy with respect to S. Take note that these n line integrals are well defined because the curve C1, C2, up to Cn are all smooth. For the next example, we want to evaluate this line integral where C consists of the portion of the parabola y equals x squared from 0, 0 to 1, 1, followed by the line segment from 1, 1 to 3, 2. It is clear from the graph of C that it is not smooth because of the presence of this corner point. Nonetheless, observe that the portion of the parabola y equals x squared from 0, 0 to 1, 1 is a smooth curve, and we will call it curve C1. And the line segment from 1, 1 to 3, 2 is also a smooth curve, and we will call it curve C2. Hence, curve C is a piecewise smooth curve because it is the union of smooth curves C1 and C2. This means that the line integral along curve C of 2x with respect to the arc length S is just the sum of the line integral along the smooth curve C1 of 2x dS and the line integral along smooth curve C2 of 2x dS. To continue, we need to evaluate both line integrals. And for that, we need parametrizations of curves C1 and C2. We start with a parametrization of curve C2, which is the line segment from 1, 1 to 3, 2. Recall that a parametrization of the line segment joining points A and B is given by this vector valued equation with parameter t in the closed interval 0, 1. This vector variant equation is easy to remember because x1, y1 here are exactly the coordinates of the initial point A and x2 minus x1 and y2 minus y1 are the components of vector AB. In our example, the initial point of the line segment is 1, 1 and the vector from 1, 1 to 3, 2 has components 3 minus 1, which is 2, and 2 minus 1, which is 1. And hence, C2 has vector variant equation given by the, the x coordinate of the initial point is 1, so I get 1 plus the x component of the vector from 1, 1 to 3, 2 is 2, and uh, the y coordinate of your initial point is 1, plus the y component of the vector from 1, 1 to 3, 2 is 1, so I get t here. And t here is in the closed interval 0, 1. You can check that at t equals 0, you get exactly 1, 1. And at t equals 1, you get exactly 3, 2. We now turn to a parametrization of curve C1, which if you recall, is the portion of the parabola y equals x squared from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Recall that the simplest parametrization of the graph of y equals f of x, 
where x is in the closed interval a, b, is obtained by setting the parameter t to be just x. That is, the vector variant equation whose x component is t and whose y component is f of t because sure y is equal to f of x. And where the parameter t, which is just x, is in the closed interval a, b. Going back to our example, we obtain now a parametrization of curve C1 as the vector variant equation R1 of t, whose x component is t, and whose y component is t squared, because the equation of the pure parabola is y is equal to x squared. And since the portion of the parabola starts from x equals to 0 to x equals 1, then the parameter t should be in the closed interval 0, 1. In fact, we can use this to obtain another parametrization of the curve C2, if, which if you recall, is the line segment from 1, 1 to 3, 2. One can verify that the line determined by the points 1, 1, and 3, 2 has equation y equals 1 half x plus 1 half. Hence, another parametrization of curve C2 is the vector variant equation S2, we will use the parameter u, whose components are u and y component 1 half u plus 1 half because your y is equal to 1 half x plus 1 half. And because the line segment starts from x equals 1 to x equals 3, then the parameter u here will be in the closed interval 1, 3. Now that we have these parametrizations of curves C1 and C2, we are now prepared to compute for the values of these line integrals. For the first line integral, remember that our goal is to write it as a definite integral with respect to the parameter t. Hence, we obtain the integral of 2 times your x here is t, so I have t. Recall that your ds is just the magnitude of r1 prime of t dt. And since your parameter t is in the closed interval 0, 1, then the limits of integration should also be from 0 to 1. Note that the derivative of r1 of t has components 1 and 2t which are the derivatives of t and t squared, respectively. Hence, I get here the integral from 0 to 1 of 2t times the magnitude of r1 prime of t is the square root of the square of 1 plus the square of 2t, which is 4, 2 squared uh, dt. To evaluate this definite integral, I can factor out 2. I can let u to be 1 plus 4t squared. The du will be 80 dt, so I can expect a factor of 1 over 8. And the integral of square root of u is uh, u to the 3 halves over 3 halves. So I get 1 plus 40 squared raised to the 3 halves all over 3 halves. And you evaluate this from t equals 0 to t equals 1. The coefficient simplified to 1 over 6. If t equals 1, I get 5 to the 3 halves, or 5 squared of 5. And at t equals 0, I just get 1. So I get 1 over 6 times 5 squared of 5 minus 1. For the next time integral, if you recall, we got two possible parametrizations of curve C2. But here, we choose the first one that we obtain. Continuing, we want to write this as a definite integral with respect to the parameter t. Hence, I have the integral of 2 times, in this case, your t is 1 plus 2t. So I get 2 times 1 plus 2t 
Again, ds is now the magnitude of r2 prime of t dt. And since the parameter t is also in the closed interval 0, 1, hence the limits of integration are still from 0 to 1. Continuing, take note that uh, r2 prime of t has components 2 and 1. Hence, I get the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 times 1 plus 2t. And the magnitude of r2 prime of t is in fact constant. It's the square of 2 plus the square of 1, which is uh, 5dt. So evaluating this definite integral, I can factor out 2 squared of 5. The integral of 1 is t. Integral of 2t is t squared. Evaluate from 0 to 1. I get 2 squared of 5 multiplied by at t equals 1. I get 2 at t equals 0. I get 0. So finally, I get uh, 4 squared of 5. And we're almost done. Going back to the original problem, which is the line integral along the entire curve C of 2x with respect to the arctic S, we just get the sum now of 1 over 6 times 5 squared of 5 minus 1 and 4 squared of 5, which if you want, you can still simplify as 29 squared of 5 minus 1 all over 6. And this is now your final answer. At the start of the video, the line integral with respect to arc length came about from finding the area of a certain curtain. We end this video by mentioning other physical interpretations of the line integral with respect to arc length. For the first one, suppose you have a wire which is shaped like the curve C whose linear density function is given by delta of xy. Then the mass small m of the wire is given by the line integral along C of a density function with respect to the arc length s. Furthermore, the center of mass of the wire can be found at the point x bar y bar, where x bar is equal to 1 over m times this line integral, and y bar is equal to 1 over m times this line integral. These two line integrals are usually called the moment of mass about the y-axis and the moment of mass about the x-axis, respectively. Another special case of the line integral along C of f of x, y with respect to s happens if your function is just a constant one. That is, it is just the line integral along C with respect to s. In that case, the value of your line integral is just the arc length of your curve C. Take note that if your curve C has parametrization R of T, where T is in the closed interval AB, then DS here becomes the magnitude of R prime of T DT, and the limits of integration are from A to B, and we get this formula, which you should have encountered in Math 22. Moreover, this result is in complete analogy to the following integrals. The integral from A to B of dx, the double integral of dA over the region R, and the triple integral of dV over the solid S. The value of this definite integral is B minus A, which is the length of your interval AB, the value of this double integral is the area of region R. The value of this tri triple integral is the volume of your solid S. And here, the value of this line integral is the arc length of your curve C. This ends the first video of this lecture. In the next video, we will talk about line integrals, but with respect to the coordinate variables x and y.